Hello, biologists. Welcome to lecture. Today we are going to talk about inheritance, and to talk about inheritance, we have to talk about this guy who you can see, which is Gregor Mendel. So you've read your textbook for your homework. You know a bit about Gregor Mendel already. What I like about Gregor Mendel is he's a great segue to talk about scientific misconduct. So Gregor Mendel, very beloved. Everyone loves the story of the monk who was playing with pea plants. Um, he did his publication in 1866. His work was mostly ignored for 35 years, and then after his death, it was rediscovered. So it was like 1900 that people started getting really into Gregor Mendel. And then in 1936 or so, someone looked at his data and ran the statistics on it and found that it's really, really good, like statistically unlikely good. And they questioned whether or not he was fudging his numbers. And people came to his defense and were like, oh, maybe he had a, uh, an unruly assistant who was accidentally making errors in the numbers and making the data fit the expectation better. And other people were defending him saying, well, he was alive and doing his work before the scientific method. So he didn't know that you had to keep data that doesn't fit your hypothesis. In his world, maybe he was like, oh, I made a mistake, so I should throw that data out. And then it kind of just got quiet again, and no one talked about it until the 1980s. And in the 1980s, someone else looked at his data and said, yeah, it's statistically very unlikely that he actually got these results from plants. Like, based on the genetics of what we know now, his data should have been more variable than what he reported. So, right now, no one actually thinks Gregor Mendel's like a liar or trying to falsify his data, but there is a discrepancy. And so, it brings up the idea of how do we know we can trust scientific data? And if we can't trust scientific data, what happens? And I, I like to talk about it because there are some really important things that happen when bad data gets published. If you publish something and it turns out not to be reputable, we as the scientific community retract it. So I'm gonna change here. This is a nice article about the Mendel data not really fitting our expectations. What I want to show you is this. This is what a retracted article looks like. Usually they'll pull it down from online so you can't even find it anymore, but they will put a big red stamp on it that says retracted. And what retracted means is we no longer find this to be something that you should cite to support your arguments. Um, meaning that the data was misrepresented, maybe by mistake or maybe intentionally. So they have found via studies that about 60% of retractions are because of academic misconduct or scientific misconduct. The person is misrepresenting the data. Sometimes they are pretending to be someone they're not. So they're pretending to have the ability to do these experiments when they don't. Sometimes they're manipulating their findings so that the data fits their expectation better. Um, sometimes they're not disclosing financial gain. So that's always a big thing. You want to know whether or not your scientist is biased and profiting from their experiment. And sometimes they're manipulating images. Um, there's been an increase in peer review fraud where some scientists will create new emails and pretend to be a whole different person and they will peer review their own work as if they are a stranger and be like, yeah, this data is great. And so it gets published. So about 60% are actual frauds. Plagiarism is involved in that. Um, using your data twice and publishing it under different titles is involved in that. And the other 40% is just mistakes. Oops, I didn't realize that this correlation wasn't there. Oops, I thought I did this calculation correctly and I didn't. Um, I'm showing you this article specifically because this is a, a famous article. This is the Wakefield article from 1998. Have you heard of it? 
this is the article that created a connection between autism and vaccines. So this was the start of the anti-vax idea. Um, we now know that there is no connection between autism and vaccines. This just the data doesn't support that idea. But Andrew Wakefield, who's the lead author on this, published this article. And take a moment and try and read that title. It's a super roundabout way to try and say it anyway. The data that he falsified, <laughs> he said he took continuously over a couple of years and he didn't. He had a sample size of 12 children. He did not get permission to investigate these children or to um, take their ethical uh, rights into consideration. And he failed to tell the journal that he was being paid by a set of lawyers who were in the process of suing vaccine companies. So he financially benefited from vaccines getting a negative connotation. So this is one of our great examples of a retraction article because the data in this article sucks and the guy that published it has been publicly shamed because of it. But it's kind of hard to figure out whether or not an article's been retracted. And in general, it doesn't happen that often. So right now, we estimate that four in 10,000 scientific publications will be retracted, which is 0.04%. It's not a lot, but it is something. And it's important to be thinking about who publications are trying to, um, who their audience is, who they're trying to sway, who's writing them, what the, the benefit of these things getting out there is. And if you're curious about retractions, there's a cool blog. It's called Retraction Watch. Um, so this is, this is it right now. And it monitors retractions in scientific publications. And you can look at the different ways that they're organized, like retracted coronavirus papers. That's happening right now because a jump in the coronavirus paper publications has happened, and that also leads to a jump in retractions. You can also do it by fields or by reasons. So if you want to look up what kind of articles have been retracted for plagiarism or for manipulating images, Photoshop has been used to falsify data. Like it's super interesting. You can also check out like the um, changes that were made or the article types. Turns out that a lot of the publication retractions are coming from one journal. So that's really interesting. And majority of publications are disproportionately connected to a certain amount of people. Like during 2002 to 2003, 56% of retractions came from one person who just made a lot of bad articles. So it's really interesting. Um, and I think it's important to keep ourselves critical. Like we know that science is supposed to be a process of judging things objectively, but we're humans, we make mistakes, we have biases, and some of us try and cheat to get ahead. And that doesn't mean that science is like perfect and it escapes all those problems because scientists are just people too. So we have to be aware that this stuff happens and we wanna be keeping an eye on it so that we know the data we're using for our own ideas and our own um, research is valid. So all connected back to Gregor Mendel and his pea plants. Email me of questions. I hope you have a lot of questions after thinking about this. I will put links to these websites that I've shown you into the lecture section, and I will talk to you soon. Have a great day.